The infinite vasts of the universe hold endless possibilities and secrets. And here's one of the intriguing questions. How life and we as humans would look like on other planets? Imagine a world where the laws of physics, the environment, and the conditions are vastly different from what we're used to. How would we adapt and evolve to survive in these strange new lands? Let's see. Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun and has a thin atmosphere. The temperatures there are extreme, with the day side reaching over 800 degrees Fahrenheit and the night side dropping to negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. So, what can we do to survive these crazy temperatures and constant solar radiation? Maybe we can magically turn into metal. For example, titanium and platinum can perfectly tolerate high temperatures. But seriously though, there is an option. We could settle underground, where the temperatures aren't so frenzied. If we lived underground, we might evolve with large eyes to better capture light. We might also evolve thicker skin to protect ourselves from the intense radiation. Basically, we have two options, become metal or become moles. Let's move on to Venus. This planet is extremely hostile. First of all, Venus is known for its thick, more toxic than your ex type of atmosphere. The whole planet is covered with carbon dioxide and its surface is absolutely dry, making it incredibly hot. The average temperature is around 847 degrees Fahrenheit, making it one of the hottest planets in our solar system. Also, don't forget about the crazy pressure. Standing on Venus would be like standing 3,000 feet underwater. Only particular hardy microbes from Earth could survive in such conditions. So, if you want to live on Venus, you might have to become a microbe. But unfortunately, since we're not microbes, we have to wear special gear and equipment to survive there. Maybe we'd have to develop a heat-resistant exoskeleton to protect ourselves, as well as get some new lungs that can filter out the toxic elements in the atmosphere. Let's talk about our favorite red sibling, Mars. The first noticeable change after a few hundred years would be your new skeleton. The gravity on Mars is much weaker than on Earth, so your muscles and bones would shrink. To make up for this difference, you'd have to eat more and probably start going to the gym. Also, you'd have to adapt to the low atmospheric pressure and colder temperatures. You need to retain heat, right? That means you'd need a thicker layer of body fat. Sorry folks, but on Mars, we might become fatter. Another reason to start working out. Another big change would occur in your skin. Your skin is like a big barrier that protects you from harmful things such as bacteria, UV light, looking totally creepy, and so on. So what would happen to it? Most likely, you would turn orange, due to the carotenoids. Carotenoids are a type of nutrient that you get from foods such as carrots, potatoes, tomatoes, and so on. They protect very well against ultraviolet radiation on Mars. They only have one downside. By eating a lot of pumpkins from the Martian farmer's market, you'll gradually start to turn orange. But maybe it's not so bad. Maybe life on Jupiter would be easier. Yeah, no, it has no solid land. This planet is made up of hydrogen and helium and is referred to as a gas giant. You would simply float there, like in a huge cloud. And even if you managed to land and tried to walk, it would be like moving through a super thick fog. So how would we evolve there? Firstly, we might become much larger in size to withstand the immense pressures. Secondly, the temperature fluctuations on Jupiter are enormous. The surface is terrifyingly cold and the temperature rises significantly under the outer layers of the atmosphere. Thirdly, if you lived on Jupiter, there would be no verbal language. This gas giant absorbs radio waves, so even if you were speaking, no one would hear you. There would be no music either, so no parties. And what's the point then? Hey, maybe we could communicate with sign language. But that's not so simple either. Jupiter is full of wild winds and storm clouds, so it's unlikely you would be able to see anything. So even if we evolved there in some way, our lives would still not be easy. Before landing on Saturn, you would probably want to check out its iconic rings, but you wouldn't be able to do that because Saturn's rings consist of a bunch of ice particles flying in space, so it would be extremely hard to land. So let's go straight to Saturn itself. At first, it may seem that Saturn is not bad for us, 
Some layers of this gas giant have quite pleasant temperatures. If we dive deeper into Saturn, it gets surprisingly warm, up to 26 degrees Fahrenheit in its second layer. This is an average temperature in countries like Sweden and Canada. But unfortunately, this is only one such layer. The rest of the planet is incredibly cold, so in order to survive on Saturn, we'd have to do a lot of work. In addition to the cold, we'd have to deal with the planet's harsh environment, including its intense storms, strong winds, and radiation. To protect ourselves from these conditions, we'd need to evolve tough skin again, find some insulation, and so on. Next planet is Uranus. Uranus has a very different environment from Earth, with much colder temperatures, a lack of a solid surface, and a much different atmosphere. It's like another Jupiter, but with blue vibes. It's not that bad, though. There's even water on Uranus. The only problem is, the planet is full of ammonia, that nasty stuff we use for cleaning. So don't be surprised if you feel the gross smell. Also, it's incredibly cold out there, almost like a never-ending winter. So what would it be like to survive in such a dark and harsh environment? We'd need thicker skin, again, to cope with extreme temperatures. And again, we'd need larger eyes to see better in all this darkness. We might even have to develop a new hearing system, like that of dolphins. Wouldn't that be fun? Let's move on to Neptune. If human beings were to evolve on Neptune, they would need to adapt to its harsh conditions. Neptune, the eighth and farthest planet from our Sun, is another gas giant. The only difference is this planet may have a solid core. If we were to live on Neptune, we'd need to float or swim in its methane-rich atmosphere. We'd also need to develop gills or something like that in order to breathe. Basically, we'd turn into space reptiles or cosmic fishes. The gravity on Neptune is slightly stronger than Earth's, but strong winds make it difficult to stand in one place. To withstand the wind, we need to be much heavier. Once again, you need to eat a lot and pump up some muscles. Yeah, yeah, technically it's not a planet, but we still love it and can't forget it. A small, distant, and incredibly cold world. Pluto's even smaller than our moon, and because of that, there's almost no gravity there. It will be extremely difficult to stand on it. To avoid accidentally flying into outer space while playing football, we need to create a fake gravity machine. And if we don't want to feel dizzy, we need to evolve a brand new nervous system. But Pluto isn't all that bad. For example, there's liquid water under the surface, and even some icy mountains. Maybe it would be possible to survive there if we had some serious equipment, clothes, supplies, and… nah, too much hassle. Anyway. From the scorching heat of Mercury to the freezing temperatures of Neptune, each planet has a unique set of environmental challenges and opportunities for evolution. While we may never truly know what humans would look like on these other worlds, it's exciting to consider the endless possibilities. Never stop looking at the stars and asking these questions. When you explode planets, things get red hot. Atmospheres are stripped away. Stuff is flying apart. Everything collapses. The world becomes brighter than a dozen suns. You squeeze your eyes shut and cover your ears. Your hair stands on end. The sheer power of a cosmic blast is terrifying. Some time before the explosion, you're hovering in almost complete darkness. Below, you see the moon, or what you think looks like the moon. The surface of this light-colored sphere is pockmarked with craters left by meteorites. You see huge, steep hills stretching for miles. It's Mercury, and right now, you're going to explode it. As if in slow-mo, you watch the planet fall apart. And then, in the blink of an eye, you see a wall of debris closing in on you. First, giant chunks of rock. Those are all that's left of the planet's solid crust and rocky mantle. The appearance and structure of the debris flying in your direction changes. Now, the stuff looks liquid, like splashes of quicksilver. That's Mercury's metallic core bursting apart. It used to take up 85% of the planet's volume. And finally, it's a firework of solid pieces again. It's the planet's solid core. The explosion is so powerful, it knocks Earth into a different orbit. The sun hiccups and swallows down an enormous cloud of dust. That's everything Mercury has left behind. But don't worry, our solar system won't lose any planets. 
This whole explosion thing is only a temporary experiment. Once you're done watching the show, you press another button, and the planet gets back together, as if you've hit rewind. You approach the next planet on your way. Its surface is hiding under a super dense atmosphere made up of carbon dioxide. If you decided to land on Venus, you'd watch thick clouds of sulfuric acid pass by. You'd see the planet's surface, reddish brown, dry, and incredibly hot. You'd probably walk across flat, smooth plains, covering two-thirds of the planet's surface. You'd gawk at volcanoes littering Venus, all 1,600 of them. Unfortunately, you won't be able to do that, because you press the button. Boom! Huge chunks of basalt fly away from the center of the explosion. That used to be the planet's 12-mile thick crust. Then you spot bright burning meteors flying towards you at incredible speed. Those are chunks of Venus's molten rocky mantle. The fire rain seems endless, maybe because the mantle was 1,200 miles thick. But that's not the most massive part of the planet. The power of the explosion forces apart Venus's metallic iron core. This core used to be twice as wide as the mantle. You reach the blue marble of your home planet. What will its insides look like, scattered in space? From above, Earth looks pretty. 71% of its surface is blue, because of all that water, seas and oceans. There are also areas of green, yellow, and brown and white swirls. You press the button. The planet bursts apart in a hailstorm of rocks. They're what's left from Earth's thin crust and much, much thicker mantle. It used to take up nearly 84% of the entire planet's volume. You see the rocky rain change into something way more liquid. It's scorching hot iron and nickel that used to make up Earth's outer core. The metals weren't under enough pressure to be solid. The bang is so powerful that it takes apart Earth's inner core. It used to be a solid ball of iron and nickel. After the pieces fly apart, they follow their own orbits around the sun. The most massive chunks crash into the moon, and some travel further and get swallowed by our star. You can't linger. The red planet is waiting for you. The surface of Mars is covered with rusty colored dust. The thickness of the dust layer varies from area to area, but in most places, it's seven feet thick. The ground is colored gold, brown, tan, and even greenish. The hue depends on the minerals that make up the soil. The planet's surface is rocky. It's covered with dry lake beds, craters, volcanoes, and canyons. Bang! Mars is a rocky planet. You have to dodge mountain-sized chunks of crust made up of volcanic basalt rock. What you see next looks as if you've blown up huge amounts of soft, rocky toothpaste. That used to be Mars's mantle, composed of oxygen, silicates, and other minerals. And then, the flying pieces get solid again. Ah, it's the planet's core's turn. It was solid, made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur. Billions and trillions of fragments of all sizes, from a small moon to pieces several feet wide, get launched in all directions. But only very few parts have enough momentum to leave the solar system. The whole event slightly changes Earth's orbit, and the temperature on our planet goes up by 18 degrees Fahrenheit. You leave rocky planets behind and close in on the first gas giant on your way. It's Jupiter. Thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds hide its surface. They make the planet look colorful and beautifully striped. You hit the button. This time, the view is different. Instead of chunks of solid crust, you see jet streams of gas accelerating from the planet's center. It's what used to be Jupiter's atmosphere, made up of hydrogen and helium gas. In no time, the matter hurtling away to space turns liquid. That's hydrogen changing its form under immense atmospheric pressure closer to the center of the planet. A bit later, the liquid is already a mixture of metallic hydrogen and helium. And finally, something solid. It was probably Jupiter's core, 14 to 18 times the mass of Earth. The gas giant's diameter was about 90,000 miles, but the blast lasts no more than half a second. 
the explosion of Jupiter is so strong, it evaporates smaller planets like Mars and Earth. The Sun remains pretty much untouched. It gets hotter and kind of unstable for a bit, but it doesn't last long. The next gas giant on your way is Saturn. At first sight, it looks as if the planet has a surface. The seemingly solid yellowish-brown sphere is surrounded by layers of clouds. Saturn's trademark rings are awesome and colorful, gray, beige, and tan. They're actually groups of tiny ringlets that are made up of floating chunks of water, ice, rocks, and dust. These chunks range in size from specks to massive skyscraper-sized pieces. While orbiting Saturn, they keep colliding, and larger pieces get shattered. You're surprised to see that the rings aren't perfectly round. They have bends caused by the gravitational pull from the nearby moons. 53 of them are confirmed. Titan, an icy world bigger than our moon and even Mercury, is the largest. What you see looks eerily similar to what happened when you exploded Jupiter. There's only one difference. Saturn's rings break apart, sending rocks and ice flying into space at incredible speed. The largest pieces crash with the planet's moons, wiping away the smallest of them. You see streams of gas, mostly hydrogen and helium, with a bit of methane, ammonia, and water. They're moving at breakneck speed away from where the center of the planet used to be. After that, splashes of liquid matter, that's liquid hydrogen, that later turns metallic. And finally, the chunks of the solid core made up of rocky materials. You're looking at a beautiful blue-green sphere of the ice giant Uranus. The planet gets this unusual hue when the light from the sun gets reflected off the planet's surface. Plus, Uranus's atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium, with traces of methane gas that absorb the red light. Anyway, bang! This time, it's massive blobs of ice that are hurtling in your direction first. They used to be the part of the planet's ice mantle that once made up 80% of the planet's volume. But why does this ice look liquid? On Uranus, frozen liquid isn't solid like on Earth. Ice is a hot, dense fluid made up of water, ammonia ice, and methane. It's often called the Water Ammonia Ocean. After the bizarre ice rain, you see solid pieces of the planet's rocky core. It used to be small, no more than half the Earth's mass. Some of Uranus's moons get pulverized in the explosion, and several even get ejected out of the solar system. The explosion also slightly shifts Neptune's orbit. And the last planet on your way, Neptune. It looks blue because of a layer of swirling gas and permanent clouds. No time to linger. Boom! The planet doesn't have a solid surface. That's why, after pressing the button, you see Neptune's liquid mantle bursting. It looks like a water-filled balloon thrown down from the 50th floor. This sends splashes of water, ammonia, and methane ices away into space. It's followed by lava-like remains of the planet's mantle. It used to be liquid, red-hot, and rich in methane, ammonia, and water. That's what's left from Neptune's solid core, made up of iron and other metals. Well, looky here. You're about to figure out what lies under the surface of each planet in the solar system. Get into your spaceship, equipped with the largest drill you can only imagine, and off you go. You start with Mercury. It's the closest planet to the Sun. At first sight, the place looks similar to our good old moon. But after landing, you understand it's an illusion. All around your spaceship, there are craters left by meteorites. The planet's surface is littered with huge steep hills. Some of them are two miles high and stretch for hundreds of miles. You start drilling and immediately understand it's going to be tough. Mercury is the second densest planet in the solar system, topped only by Earth. The planet's outer shell is 250 miles of solid crust and rocky mantle. After getting through it, you see Mercury's metallic core. It takes up almost 85% of the planet's volume and contains more iron than any other planet we know about. You don't need to drill anymore, the outer core is liquid. But once you reach the solid inner core, you have to switch that drill on again. The next planet you're going to explore is Venus. It's the hottest planet in the solar system. The average temperatures there are high enough to melt lead. 
the pressure on the planet is 90 times greater than that on Earth. Your spacecraft is traveling through thick clouds of sulfuric acid. Venus's surface is reddish-brown and extremely dry. You land in the middle of a flat, smooth plane. Planes like this cover two-thirds of the planet's surface. Well, you get down to work. The drill starts moving through the crust. It consists mostly of basalt and is almost 12 miles wide. The next layer is a molten rocky mantle. After some time, you get the feeling it'll never end. No wonder, it's 1,200 miles thick. Finally, you arrive at the planet's metallic iron core. It's huge, twice wider than the mantle. See that blue sphere slightly to the left? It's Earth! How about you skip it for the moment and get back to it later? Right now, Mars sounds so much more exciting. Whew! The place is freezing cold. The temperature is minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. The planet looks reddish, and as soon as you make your first step on its surface, it becomes clear why. The ground's covered with rusty-colored dust. Its fine particles are also floating in the air around you. In most places, that dust layer is 7 feet thick. You start drilling through the planet's thin crust. It's made up of volcanic basalt rock. Pretty soon, you reach the mantle. It's composed of oxygen, silicates, and other minerals, something like a soft, rocky toothpaste. The red planet's mantle is much thinner than Earth's. It's 1,100 miles thick at most. You feel that the drill begins to move a bit differently. Ah, must be the core. It's made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur and is between 900 and 1,200 miles across. And unlike Earth's core, it doesn't move. Time to visit the largest planet of the solar system, Jupiter. Almost 1,300 Earths could fit into this huge thing. It's also alarmingly hot about 43,000 degrees at the core. But you can't land on Jupiter because it doesn't have any solid surface. The planet is a gas giant, the key word here being gas. Your drill is also of no use, at least at first. While descending, you watch thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds passing by. Thanks to them, the planet looks colorful and beautifully striped. You keep going deeper toward the center of the planet. Its atmosphere is made up of hydrogen and helium gas. Soon, you see the hydrogen become liquid under immense atmospheric pressure. And closer to the core, this liquid turns into a mixture of metallic hydrogen and helium. You reach something that looks like a core, but even with the help of your equipment, you can't figure out whether it's a molten ball of liquid or a solid rock 14 to 18 times the mass of Earth. Maybe one day, Astronomers will help you answer this question. The next planet turns out to be exceptionally windy, like me. The winds on Saturn travel at more than 1,100 miles per hour at the equator. From above, it looks as if the gas giant has a solid yellowish-brown surface. You get through several different layers of clouds, and suddenly, you realize you can't land your spacecraft here as well. Saturn is the least dense planet in the solar system. It has only one-eighth the average Earth's density. If you found a pool of water large enough to fit the ring planet, the gas giant would float. If you kept going down, you'd probably have found Saturn's core. It's likely to be rocky, with hydrogen and helium surrounding it. Ah, you're approaching the ice giant Uranus, which means there's going to be some surface to land on. Or not. The planet isn't solid. You fly through the upper atmosphere and sink into the liquid icy center. The ice, which makes up 80% of the planet's mass, is actually a hot, dense fluid. It consists of water, ammonia ice, and methane. This part of the planet is sometimes called a water-ammonia ocean. This ice surrounds a solid rocky core. That's where you can finally use your drill. The core small, half the Earth's mass. Compared to other planets, it's also rather cool, a mere 9,000 degrees. You're reaching the farthest point of your journey, Neptune. It's four times the size of Earth, but 17 times as heavy. The bluish surface you see when coming closer is a layer of permanent clouds and swirling gas. Below this surface, there's a large mantle, liquid and red hot. The mantle is rich in methane, ammonia, and water and equals 15 Earth's masses. At last, you have something to drill. The planet's core is solid. 
It consists mostly of iron and other metals. Keep drilling until you're at a depth of 4,500 miles. Astronomers are almost sure that's where you'll find a diamond layer. That's right, it rains diamond crystals there. Well, time to go back home. People have drilled pretty deep holes here. But they were never deep enough to even get through the crust. After the drills traveled one-third of the way, the temperature reached 360 degrees, and the equipment couldn't operate any longer. But your drill is much stronger than that. That's why you easily move through the crust. It takes up only 1% of Earth's volume and is broken into tectonic plates. They let heat escape from the Earth's interior. You reach the mantle. This layer is about 1,800 miles thick and makes nearly 84% of the planet's volume. It consists of silicate rocks rich in iron and magnesium. Well, you don't need to drill anymore. The 1,500-mile thick outer core is liquid. It consists of iron and nickel, but the pressure isn't high enough for it to be solid. You pass through the boundary between the outer and inner core. It's quite a challenge. The temperature there is 10,800 degrees, as hot as on the sun's surface. And the pressure is 3.3 million times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. The inner core is a solid ball made of iron and nickel. Its radius is 760 miles. It makes 20% of the Earth's radius and 80% of the Moon's. Scientists know what's going on under the crust of the planets that are millions and billions of miles away from us. And they don't even need to go there, drill through their surface and peek inside. They combine information about the planet's density, magnetic field, mountain ranges, heat, and seismic activity to make their smart assumptions. For example, Earth's magnetic field shields us and the atmosphere from solar flares and solar winds. Scientists believe that it exists thanks to a hot iron core inside the planet. It rotates and generates invisible protection, like an enormous scorching hot dynamo. And this magnetic field is way stronger than that on Mars. It probably means that something happened to the red planet's core. Maybe it cooled down and kind of switched off. Or maybe there wasn't any magnetic field to begin with. There are loads of active volcanoes on Earth's surface. That's how scientists can conclude there must be a relatively thin crust. And the mantle must be made of liquid magma. But Martian volcanoes aren't active anymore. There could have been a hot liquid mantle under the planet's crust once. But after the volcanoes formed, something went wrong. The interior probably cooled down or the crust somehow became thicker. Whatever it was, it successfully stopped magma from getting to the surface. And then there's also seismic activity. If many Earth or Mars or Venus quakes happen on the planet, there's a lot going on under the surface. If we talk about Earth, it's the movements of tectonic plates. Most earthquakes happen along their edges. If there's little seismic activity on the planet, it might have no plate tectonics then its interior is calm. Researchers also pay attention to how long it takes a seismic wave to go through a planet or how it echoes inside. It can help to get more information about the density of the crust, what the mantle's made of, and so on. But scientists have to be extremely careful with the causes of these earthquakes. Sometimes they can occur after meteorites hit the planet, and it has no connection with the processes going on under the surface. Of course, these last two methods will only work with rock planets, mainly because gas giants have neither volcanoes nor seismic activity. Boy, all this talk about thin crust and thick crust is making me hungry. Hey, you up for some pizza? <laughs>